learned after four months. Uh, you know, I, I, I loved watching your talk, Crystal, and uh, you made me think of a, a lecture that Rosemary Knight once gave at the School of Mines, and I know many of you know Rosemary. And she started out uh, her lecture by saying, do you reali realize that what you do matters? That you don't do it in a vacuum, but that it matters. And I, and I thought it was, I think sort of many of us know that, but she articulated that, uh, that, that beautifully. And, um, and I like the broad view that you took in your, uh, in your presentation. I, let me, let's first take a minute and see if there's any reactions about the uh, session that I did yesterday. I mean, maybe you've been sleeping on it or something else came up. I'm just... Okay. If not, let's then go for the topic of today. Are you thriving or surviving? This, this has to do with, with something which puzzled me that on the one hand, um, as, as academics, we have sort of dream jobs. We can usually pursue our interests. And, um, and yet there's also a lot of stress and angst among academics. And of course, a lot of that is, is very understandable. We are, we are under pressure. We are under pressure to perform. We are under pressure to, um, to, to, to get research funding. But still, overall, we have sort of dream jobs. And I, and I started asking myself the question, OK, so, so why is this community not thriving more? And that, that question led to, um, to a book, which I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share that with you. Um, so let me give me a second. Okay, do you see the whole, the whole book, the one slide, or do we need to switch screens? Okay, good. So this is, um, um, I wrote this book with a mines colleague, uh, Jen Schneider. So it, I, I don't think this book is going to cited, get cited very often, but uh, this is going to be probably the most miscited publication ever with Schneider and Schneider, because people can't even spell my name correctly. Um, but interestingly, this book started over coffee. I mean, this, and, and, and this has to do, oh, oh my God, I'm sorry. Uh, this book started over coffee and um, because we just got together, we, we were just chatting sort of, sort of uh, in unstructured ways. And at one point the idea rose to, uh, to write this book. And I first want to show you some cartoons from this book. My, my brother is a great artist. He made some cartoons. I'd just like you to take a look at these cartoons and see if there's anything that, that speaks to you that you recognize um and then and then we can share that so here's the first cartoon um working under the commonly held belief that no matter how hard we work it never is enough you know we, we carry these communal beliefs in this in the, in the in the scientific community and i think one of them is that you can never work hard enough and in fact even if you work as hard as you can it still isn't enough there's always somebody better than you are and so there's always a reason to feel miserable at least if you if you buy into this Second one is the image of a vaudeville performer keeping all the balls in the air and staying perched on the pedestal of, of success. Um, you know, I've, 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 I, I know this really well. You know, we, we, when, when we were raising a family, we had two jobs and I often felt like uh, this mother does. And, um, um, and so it was interesting to, uh, um, to go through this and maintain my sanity. I don't know if I did actually. That's an interesting question. And the last, uh, the other cartoon is, is about the imposter syndrome. The feeling of not belonging can lead to or, or exaggerate the imposter syndrome. So the imposter syndrome is um, that you feel like it was all a mistake that you are where you are. It was a mistake that you were admitted to graduate school and that you got this job and that you got this grant and whatnot. And one day, one day the rest of the world is going to find out. So you better work really, really hard to prevent them from finding out what a fraud you are. Uh, statistically, a third of the scientists uh, suffers from this. And here's the last cartoon. Uh, you know, do you want to please somebody? Perhaps somebody who is not even alive anymore. So what is driving our behavior? Are we doing the things that are truly important to us? Or um, are we doing the, the are, are, we, are we basically marching to the drums of others? 
that's an important question to ask ourselves too. So I'd, I'd, list, I'd just like to ask you, you know, what, does anything come up with these cartoons? You recognize anything or do you say, well, wait a minute, that's, this is not what my life looks like or, and that may very well be, I hope, I hope it does. I'm just curious to your responses. So I would love it if a few of you could share a little either in the chat box or better even just by speaking out. You can raise your hand or just speak up. I'll start for you all just because um, I'll give people a moment to think. And I know that I've had the opportunity to look at that book before, but um, certainly I feel um, like I've suffered from imposter syndrome, um, especially when I was in graduate school and an early career faculty member. Um, I still feel that pressure to, um, to continue to work above and beyond what is probably reasonable to sort of keep up. So I, I, I think many of those images resonate with me, even as someone who's sort of a senior faculty member that someone might consider like having made it. Um, I, I still very much suffer from some of the things in that picture. Yeah. And you're not alone, you know? It's, um, do you still feel like that or is it sort of, has it subsided over the years? Uh, it has subsided over the years, but it comes and goes. So um, for me, it comes back with any sort of accolade. If anyone tells me that something has been done right, then that imposter syndrome comes back. And I think, oh, well, they don't know that I wasn't the right person for that award, right? Right, right, yeah. Well, you get quite a few accolades, rightly. So, <laughs> no, I can see that. You feel like uh, I, I don't deserve it. By the way, the, the, the thing with accolades and scientific prizes is that, um, I think rarely people <clears throat> people get them who don't deserve them. The the injustice that is part of it is that there's also a lot of people who deserve them who don't get them. I think I, a I lot. Think Pardon? I was gonna add in that a lot of the, the message about you don't work enough time, that mm -hmm. is, at least when I was a graduate student, that was basically directly said to us that wasn't even... Um, yes. You know, so that was passed to us directly that you, you have to keep working more and more. So it wasn't even something we just internalized from nowhere. And I think that message as an academic, now I'm a professor, is essentially given to us by um, all of the administration because we are constantly asked to do more and more, let, let yet we have less and less um, staff and help um, to actually do those things. So. Yeah. Well, you know, and, 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 and it is a reality. On the other hand, as we discussed yesterday, working more and more is not always better. I mean, sometimes, sometimes taking, you know, taking the step back is the right thing to do. Um, or like, as I described with my, when I, when I showed you the cover of that, of that book, The Joy of Science, that started over coffee. You know, that was, that was a contribution I made. And I wouldn't have started without taking you know, a 30 minute break with a colleague on a regular basis and to just sit down and, 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 and chat. So there, there's definitely two sides to the coins, right? I mean, there is, there is the real drive to produce, um, um, but more is not always better. The, the other thing is that, of course, it's, it's all, I, I don't know, I mean, this, this is very personal, but when I went to graduate school, um, our, our, the, I, I went to Princeton and the, 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 our lab was off campus. It was in Forestal campus. You had to take a shuttle to go there. And every evening, all the students would take the shuttle to go to, go to the lab. Um, if you wouldn't take the shuttle, somebody would ask the next morning, I didn't see you yesterday, Rule. I mean, just, just, just an observation. But it was the students who would communicate it to each other. It wasn't the faculty. In fact, if you would be on the shuttle and you'd go into the lab and you would just read magazines or drink coffee or whatever that was okay just not being there was not okay so there also was this this uh, this, this communal sense like you know thou shalt be in the lab in the evenings right whether whether you're useful or not and i think there's a lot of part part of i mean the pressure that you that you sketch are very real i recognize it i suffer from it too um but part of it is also self-inflicted it's sort of that the, the, they also hold a sense of communal beliefs so, for example, there is this um, um, this this belief that you you have to be the best. Right? Well, I can tell you, out of this group of people that is watching this, only one person can be the best, and all the other sixty-four they're out of luck. <laughs> so, yeah, Kamini asked for graduate students. I'd love to hear from some graduate students too.
No takers? Yeah, I guess just to echo the work expectation, I remember walking into orientation and the first sentence that was relayed to us was, if you're not working 60 plus hours a week, you will not be a successful graduate student. Um, and that has really sat with me throughout this whole process. Yeah, yeah. And the interesting thing is what lies behind that statement, right? Because sometimes, I mean, sometimes we have to work hard, right? There's a lot of things to be done to, to, um, to make progress. But we also have lives to live, you know? Um, we, have, we have a life outside of, outside of work. Um, and I simply don't think that, that working harder and harder to the point of exhaustion is actually productive. And of course, where to find it, that, 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 where to draw the line, that's, that's, a, hard, that's a hard question to answer. Um, but a lot of it, I think, is also something that we impose on each other. Uh, this, this, this sort of, this relentless uh, drive to be the best and the, 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 the thing that, the, the, the belief that you can only be the best if you give everything, everything. Um, and let me tell you, you know, your life is a fixed sum game. So what you take away from one part of your life, what you take in one part of your life, you're going to take away from another part of your life. It's very simple. I want to give you a different perspective on this too. And I want to show you a, a, first a cartoon and then, and then a brief video that, that sort of illustrates this. Um, okay, so we'll go to... Okay, so here you see a, a cartoon with different, different, um, different um, mindsets. And in the middle there is a line, which is in the, uh, it's the gray area. And the mindsets uh, above and below the line, they mirror each other. So for example, above the line, you see trust here, and the, 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 the counterpart is, is fear. So one of them is sort of a positive, exp a positive expression of our level of trust. Fear is a, is a, is a negative expression of lack of trust and the same with excitement versus exhaustion enthusiasm versus anxiety you know dedication versus de defiance authenticity versus self-importance etc etc and so the question is are you living above the line and below the line because the, the, these different mindsets they, they mirror each other's and one of them is sort of the negative of the other of the other one and how, how, do you, how do you deal with this? How can you, what, what can you do to sort of live above the line? To, so for example, to, to, to live from a fear of trust and to work from a fear of trust rather than from a fear of, than from a state of, of fear. Um, so for example, the state of trust might be uh, a confidence that if you, if, you, if you put in the time, if you put in the dedication, you will attract research funding if you live from a state of fear, then you, your, your basic mindset is there never is enough. And no matter how good my proposal is, it won't get funded anyhow. Right? This, those are very different ways of, 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 of working. So I'd, I'd like to, to talk about, okay, how do, we, how do we get ourselves above the line? How do we, how do we shake off the, the sort of the below the line uh, aspects of our, of our mindset to have a more positive mindset? So I, I first want to show the video um, with you. that speaks to the same topic. Let me see. Um, and I have to make sure I share the sound. Okay, you can see the, the video. Here we go. At www.conscious.is. Animation by Graham Franks. www.grahamfranks.com.
One question that conscious leaders ask themselves over and over is, where am I? To support leaders in locating themselves as they ask the question, where am I? We offer this tool, a line, a simple black line. At any moment, all leaders and all people are either above the line or below the line. Our location describes how we're being with what is occurring in our life right now. If we're above the line, we are open, curious, and committed to learning. If we are below the line, we are closed, defensive, and committed to being right. Stop right now and simply ask yourself, where am I? In this now moment, am I above the line or below the line? Typically, when people are below the line, they believe certain things about the world. For example, they believe there is not enough. It could be that there's not enough money, or time, or space, or energy, or love. People below the line also believe that their story about the situation is right. People below the line also believe that there is a threat out there. Something or someone is threatening their desire for approval, control, or security. And people below the line see the situation as serious. The deeper below the line they are, the more serious things look. People below the line tend to behave certain ways as well. They tend to cling to an opinion, find fault and blame, gossip, explain, rationalize and justify, get overwhelmed, and avoid conflict or pursue conflict for the sake of winning. When people are above the line, they believe that learning and growing are more important than being right. They believe that all people and circumstances are their allies, here for their growth. They believe that from a distance, almost everything is funny. People above the line live in curiosity, listen deeply, speak unarguably, question all their beliefs, and live a life of play. Now, knowing what you know about being above or below the line, where are you? Did we yeah. lose you? So in many ways, being below the line is natural and normal. I'm, I'm but when we are below the I'm line... I'm sorry, did, I, did your connection fall away? I did on my end, but it might have just been me. I think I see a couple nodding heads. So maybe just there at the end it fell no, away. No, I have a problem. Let, let, me, let me just rewind one minute. I'm sorry, because that's probably where it fell, where it fell away. They believe that all people and circumstances are their allies, here for their growth. They believe that from a distance, almost everything is funny. People above the line live in curiosity, listen deeply, speak unarguably, question all their beliefs, and live a life of play. Now, knowing what you know about being above or below the line, where are you? One thing to know as you consider this question, we are hardwired to go below the line. Literally, our brain is programmed to perceive threat. And when it does, a chemical cocktail courses through our veins and we go below the line. This reaction was designed to help us survive in the presence of a real threat to our physical survival. An issue for modern day leaders is that often our brains can't tell the difference between a threat to our physical survival and a threat to our ego or identity. We react and get defensive when we experience a threat to our ego. So in many ways, being below the line is natural and normal. But when we are below the line, we're not in a state, literally brain state, of high creativity, collaboration, innovation, and relational connection. We're simply trying to survive. Leaders today can't thrive if they're in survival mode. So the first activity of conscious leadership is location, location, location. In this now moment, where am I? Telling ourselves and others the truth about our current location begins the great conversation. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna just put back in one of the later images. I, 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 love, I love this, <coughs> this image. Um, you know, I think actually this Joe, crystal and a yeah? Joe, are you sharing yeah? your screen? Are you sharing your screen? I hope so. Uh, Am I not? Not at the I, moment. Not not right now. 
Oh my God, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh yeah, oh, when I got disconnected, the screen share fell away. I'm it's sorry. okay, we, we heard the rest of the video, so it's... Yeah, it's okay. Okay, but I will share, I want to share the screen with you because I want to show you this, this cartoon. I think it's... Okay. Um, so here you have the, the sort of above the line and below the line. This, 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 this drawing that was made in the, in, in the video, um, which I did not square, share with you, and I, feel I'm, I apologize for that, uh, sort of exemplifies the same, the, the, the same mindset as we saw in that earlier, earlier diagram that, that, that I showed you. And um, <clears throat> so the living below the line, it, I mean, it's, it's interesting to look at some of the keywords. You know, there's words like, you know, fault and blame, security, gossip, control, conflict, approval, feeling overwhelmed are all parts of being uh, below the line. And then above the line, you have words like, you know, curiosity, question, uh, speak deeply, listen, uh, are, are all above the lines. And I think we all agree that we want to live above the line and we probably are better scientists if we love, live above the line. And, um, um, and, and what the video pointed out is that the, 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 our, our brains are hardwired to see threats and to be, and to be concerned and, and to, to push us into survival mode and that, and that gets us below the line. So we need to take action to, 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 to get a different mindset. This is not something that comes naturally. Um, you know, I, 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 I loved when I hear Crystal speak when she, when she got advice like, well, if you're doing this sort of work, it's sort of extra and this does not really count to your, to your, uh, to your normal job, right? That's the below the line thinking. Like there, there is not enough, and and this is this doesn't fit into the the mold of what of what we do. So if you're crazy enough to do it, well, go ahead. But you do it in your free time, and then it turns out to be a very successful project that attracted a lot of grants. And and it was just, I presume, by having a mindset of just you know knowing what's important, going for it, um, and, and and just diving in. So the question. So here's the here's the the, the, the question. So how do you how do you get yourself above the line? How do you get yourself out of that mindset uh, that you see in the bottom half of this of this cartoon? What can you do in your, in your normal daily life to basically get above the line to get into a positive and a constructive mindset in which you thrive instead of living in a mindset where you are in in survival mode? So I'm going to stop the sharing. I'm going to share, by the way, I'm going to share the slides with, uh, with Kamini. You can, Kamini, if you could forward them and it has the link to this, to this video and other materials for that. Uh... So I'm curious to hear about your thoughts. You know, what, what, what can you do to, to get yourself um, above the line to help you thrive? Any ideas? I can share um, since I had a total, I, I hit the below the line place last week um, around Wednesday and I recognized it in a big way and decided I really need to get back above the line to do the job that I love and be the mentor I can be with my students. Um, and to what I think is really important, which is regain my sense of humor, which I found is key in this job um so i just i hit a hard stop i sent an email out to my students i said i'm going offline for four days i went outside and i camped with my family and my quarantine pod of friends and i came back ready to go on sunday evening and it was the best thing i could have done and i try to impart that in mentoring my students too we talk a lot about kind of personal sustainability in doing this work and taking breaks and also um, co-developing our, our goals and our, our deadlines together so that when we have those moments of like, I'm not getting this done, we can kind of revisit why and unpack it and say, yeah. is it because I, I need a break or, or what is it? So we talk a lot about this process in my yeah. group and I try to honor that by doing doing the work myself well wonderful you know thank you for sharing that and uh and, and yeah and you mentioned important a couple of important points i mean basically taking the time out 
It's basically, I, I, you, I, I think it's also like if you're on fire, you have stop, drop and roll, right? And I think if you're mentally in a pit, then also, you know, stop, drop and roll in a different way, is, I think is important. So uh, you, you are, you're modeling that, but it's also, I, I love it that you also share this with your students because, you know, you're, you're, you're helping um, grow the next generation of scientists and you're helping to create their mindsets. And I think it's really important to, uh, to help them develop healthy mindsets. And I know there's plenty of advisors who, who feel like, uh, you know, you, you put your students under pressure and you get the best out of them, which I think is an illusion. Or you supervise them by the mushroom methods. You, you give them, you know, if you want to grow a mushroom, you put them on dung and you let them grow in the dark. So that's what you do with your students. You give them a pile of shit every month, you put them in a dark room and you watch if they're ready yet. And it doesn't work like that. But let's also talk about, I want to ask a question. So, I mean, I don't know any details of what happened and, and why you took the, the time out, but what would have been the consequence of not taking the time out? I would have been a mess. <laughs> I wouldn't have been able to work effectively um, yeah. on, on anything by myself, with my collaborators, with my students. And I, I, I've had enough years behind me now that I know that. So it became very yeah. obvious to me. Yeah. And you might have been a mess for yourself and you might have created a mess for others too. Right? At least that's what happens to me when I get overwhelmed and I get below the line, I start snapping at people and I start to, uh, you know, sometimes I, I create conflicts or I don't handle conflicts well or whatever. <laughs> um, you know, one, one, one warning sign that I see is that when I start to rehearse conversations in my mind, conversations that I'm going to have with somebody, when I, when I see myself do that, I know, okay, you're on the wrong track. Because you, you start to, to live in the world of, of just fear. So rather than just, in this case, just dealing with the issue, just now you spend your mental energy on, 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 on virtually dealing with the issue, in a, usually in a very toxic way. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Yeah. Other suggestions? I can share. Um, I think for me, you know, setting priorities are really important. Yeah. Um, sometimes we, I mean, in academia, you have, you always have deadlines. You always have things to do. Right. And sometimes I, I, I find I tend to be, you know, buried in these deadlines, details, and forgot to come back and think about what's important to me. So I think yeah. taking a step back and, and, and read, looking at the bigger picture a bit and think about what's really important is, is one way for me to get out. I was thinking about the crystals, you know, um, experience about, you know, you are doing too much outreach. That's what other people tell her but you know she nice. if this is really important to her that makes this is on top of her priority list and it's important to her so um i think it's important to 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 think about what's important to yourself right you know that that, that I, I love the point that you make and 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 there is a um it's very important that you know by which drummer are you marching and are, are you marching by your own drummer or are you are you marching by the somebody else's drummer. And I, and I don't want to say this in the sense of being a social, absolutely not. We need to be aware of the fact that we are part of a network, that we are not on this planet alone, that we're not at the workplace alone, so that you're part of a, you know, a web of people. And this is what Stephen Covey calls the state of interdependence. Um, but it's important that you also know um, what, what are your priorities, because it's very easy to let the rest of the world set your priorities. right? right? dumping world in your lap, the work in your lap, or by raising expectations. Um, so thank you for, for bringing that up. Yeah, any other comments? Any other suggestions? Any students? I was going to say, this is Pam, just even recognizing it, I think, took a long time for me, like yeah. trying to trying to actually set up a system to recognize when I was starting to spiral down so that I could start to make steps away from that. It took me a long time to see that. And, you know, I, it's, I don't know if there's a way to help people develop 
you know, warning, warning signs sooner so they know how to monitor themselves because I wish I had known how to. Great. Well, I love it that you, that you bring it up, Pam. And I think, um, you know, one of the ways of, of monitoring, um, monitoring them that is, is sort of uh, what I would call maintaining mental hygiene. Like if you, if, if, you, if, if you live in a place and you never clean it, it becomes a mess. And our mind is like that too. There's just stuff and patterns accumulating there. And it's important to be aware of what, what goes on in your mind. And so the, the, the monitoring, the mental hygiene, that's a, I, I have a friend, he's a psychiatrist and he, he often admonishes me and he says, Roel, what's your mental hygiene? When, when, did you, when did you clean for the last time? I mean, but, but your thinking matters. You know, you might think that your thoughts are ethereal things and of course they are in certain ways, but they help uh, shape your, your reality. So if, for example, if I go to work and I feel resentful because, um, I, I feel not recognized or whatever it is. And I'm, I'm stuck and, I'm, and I keep on telling myself, you know, you work so hard and nobody recognizes what you're doing. And why are you really doing this? So I'm losing my motivation. Um, I, I might actually stop listening to colleagues because I'm actually so busy telling myself what they are thinking that I actually stop listening to what they actually are telling me. Um, I may spend a lot of energy, I mean, a lot of energy on it. I may, you know, create a state of fear or resentment or any of these mindset that is below the line. And and really, there, what it, what it might just take is to is to say, well, just stop thinking about it and put your mind at at something else. And then, and then, you know, set a priority in what you're going to do and put your mind onto something else. And and you, you there's different ways for it. You can you can call it. Uh, uh, I, I usually. I usually refer to this as the inner dialogue. We, we continuously have a, have a dialogue going on in our head and it's more a monologue actually than a dialogue, I should say. We're telling ourselves stories all the time of what the world is like, what other people are like, what our situation is like. And, and uh, we tend to sort of, of reinforce that. So to just be aware of your inner dialogue is, 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 really, is really important. And so Pam, you asked for early, early warning signs you know, you're, you're monitoring your, in, your inner dialogue is, could be a very good uh, warning sign. And, and if you discover, for example, that, let's go back to the, to the example that I just gave of that you might feel underappreciated, um, to just stop thinking about it, or maybe ask yourself the honest question, am I really underappreciated? Am I just missing something? Or, may, or maybe uh, choosing to think like, okay, well, maybe I'm underappreciated, but I'm doing important things and that's my satisfaction. And then you just move on from there. And that takes a lot of efforts to, um, to make that into a habit. But I, re I really want to encourage you to, uh, to, uh, to monitor your inner dialogue. Um, and here again, it doesn't, this is not something that, that needs to take much time. If you think like, I'm too busy to do this, I think you're fooling yourself. Uh, you know, just stopping for two minutes and, and, and have a check in like, okay, what's going on and how can I, how can I reset? You know, that could, you could build in a minute during the day, a couple of minutes during the day, you could reflect at the end of the evening. Um, some people like to journal, I don't, but uh, some people like journaling. This is also where meditation comes in because you'll become aware of what's in your mind because the things that are really on your mind, they keep on popping back, even though you, you don't want them. And so that is very telling too. Um, so that's, that's something that I, I really want to encourage you to do, to, to, to just check on with yourself. What's going on? What am I thinking about? Can I, can I take a different point of view? And, and this is where the, where, the, where the priority setting can then be really important because you might just choose to set a priority to focus on a particular project and just not worry about something or or, or deal with an issue if you really have to, because that happens too, of course. Does that make sense? This is, or am I really off the wall now? No, that makes a lot of sense to me. You, you may tell me, you know. <laughs> um, and this, this is something that you gotta grow. This is not something that you can just do and be proficient at it. It's, it's, it's a mindset to develop, but I really wanna encourage you to do that. Um, I also, there's a, I'm watching the time. So I, there's another uh, suggestion I want to give and, and that is to, has to do with goal setting. I, I think we, we are often 
uh, fooling ourselves with the goal setting in the sense that we either have goals for our career or for example you as a graduate student your goal might be to you know graduate in a certain field in a certain amount of time and, and find a job and, and that is important i don't want to belittle that um, but you cannot really act on it on a daily basis or we set goals for let's say what we're going to do today for work um, but in one day it's usually not enough to bring to bring sort of a variation in, in our activities so i, I want to I want to um, encourage you to sort of set goals on a time scale of say about a week, because a week is a time scale where you can say, okay, how do I incorporate, let's say, work goals and personal goals? And, and so I want to show you an example of a, of, I, I just wrote down something of what, what, what might be a week, uh, a goal on the time scale of a week. Um, So this might be, and I just wrote, wrote down something. You can, you can make variations. This week, I want to prepare my class as well and be truly present for my students. I want to complete the outline of my blah, blah, blah proposal, have at least three hours of exercise, meet once a day with a colleague without having an agenda, and take 10 minutes to reflect at the end of each day. But this is a very, this goal is basically compatible with, with many, many different lifestyles. Um, Although with a young family, this might, this might be hard, getting into three hours of exercise. Um, but it's sort of a, a different type of goal than you probably are used to. This is a goal that, that articulates um, the different posts that you want to hit during the week, which have to do with, uh, with the way you perform your work. You know, prepare my class as well, be truly present for my students, complete an outline for proposals where there are some work targets in there. Uh, there is exercise in there three hours of exercise, you can actually sort of measurable, right? if you've done three hours or not. Um, meet once a day with a colleague without having an agenda. If you think to, you're, you're too busy, um, you still got to eat over lunch. And I know many of us eat at our desk. I do, I do that too. But, you know, there, there is moments to squeeze in a 15, 20 minute coffee break with somebody, things like that, um, that can be done. And, and take 10 minutes for reflection at the end of the day. Uh, these are these are things that you can you can do and you can um, you can almost put check marks marks at the, at the end of the day or at the end of the week. Okay, did did I do this? And this comes back, for example, to the question of of Evelyn also no, oh, sorry Pam, like how do I get the early warning signs? Well, you know, the ten minutes of reflection at the end of the day might might tell you what the early warning signs are, and it might help you make decisions on what you're going to do the next day. And of course, you could pack up and go for four days, but there, there might also other things you can do that are less, less disruptive for your, uh, for your life. So this is, you know, this is just a simple suggestion. And, and if you do these sort of things, um, like use a, articulate a goal like that, um, I, wanna, I wanna encourage you to write them down. Write them down and post it somewhere. And, and some of you may may notice that you have a resistance in doing that and that resistance often is due to the fact that we don't want to commit to to something we don't want to commit to setting this as a goal for example because maybe we don't want to exercise or whatever it is and um, but i think it, at least it really helps me to to write down these things and to to post them in a in a way that i can see them um, because it helps increase my my commitment to these uh, to these sort of action plans. Okay, I'm watching the time. I just want to leave some time for just comments or um, I'd love to hear your reactions. I'd just like to say that I really appreciate the reminder about reasonable goal setting and um, an example of how to do that. I think goal setting can get totally out of hand and the time scales of goals can get kind of messed up and it's it's nice to kind of have that example. So thank you. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna echo that. Um, I think one of the reasons why I'm resistant to writing things down is because then I feel like a pile of garbage when I don't accomplish the things that I planned on doing. <laughs> it's just like, vicious vicious cycle yeah yeah well but then so th that that means 
but once you notice that, then that means that your ambition level is too high. And so you should be more that. So you you you, you can go through a few of those cycles, uh, and and then and then the the so so. This is a good example of making yourself miserable, make, setting yourself goals that you cannot achieve. Rule, it's there's um, oh. Pardon? I was going to say there's a, there's a comment that um, that also might be yeah. of this time and place, which is particularly in this moment in time where things yeah. are hard for humans in general. Yeah. Um, yeah. Someone asked if you had any um, tips for sort of maintaining sanity and equilibrium at sort of this time and place. In yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, well, for one thing, I, I really uh, limit my intake of news because the, the, the news really drags me below the line. And I'm, on the one hand, I want to be informed, but I, I don't need to be informed every hour of what's going on in the world. So I, I, I read the New York Times in the morning and that's about it. I don't watch television. Um, I, do, I don't check the news during the day, so, so limit the amount of news. Um, this is, of course, a time of isolation. And so connecting with people is really important. And something really fun is happening um, because since we connect most of the time electronically anyhow, distance doesn't matter anymore. So I recently picked up a phone and called a colleague with what's happening in New Zealand, just stone cold. And it was fun to just talk to him, so, so connect with other people, I think is really important. Um, for me, I have this craving to be outside. That may, be, may not be, a, that may be very personal, but I really want to be outside because I spend a lot of time inside. So I make sure I, I go outside. I have some outside time every day. And you know, and that can often be combined, combined with social things. You can, you can take a walk and be You'll be 10 feet apart and talk. You can go for a run together or whatever it is that you like to do. Um, so to really, really spend time on doing that. And, uh, but I know this is a hard time and I, I really, I'm really concerned with a lot of the graduate students who are from abroad and they're sitting alone in a, in a room somewhere, staring at their computer the whole day and um, sometimes worrying about their own health or family. And uh, it's, 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 it's not an easy time. I organized a you know a happy hour in our research team, and things like that, just to just to connect and that's about what I can can offer here. I wish I could offer you a vaccination right now, but I can't. Well, thank you, Rol. It is really great yeah. to listen to you talk. Um, yeah. He also offers um, online meditation at Minds, which has been a really awesome thing for faculty and students. So um, yeah, there's some really great things that you've done for the community and I appreciate that. And thanks again for sharing with us today. Yeah, I'll send you the link for the meditations then you can maybe share it also because everybody's welcome and uh, it doesn't matter. Yeah, okay. Have a wonderful meeting. Thank 